Good morning, or afternoon, night, whenever time it is that you're watching this. I need to go check some stuff out in the, here in the Gila wilderness, and so I figured I'd bring you along, you know, show you some stuff, give you a little tour of the Gila, and not the, you know, spandex short, ride your bike in the wrong lane kind of tour of the Gila. But there's some interesting stuff, and so I just kind of want to take you along, show you a little bit. I'm starting out here at Woody's Corral, and Woody's Corral is kind of right in the middle of the wilderness. So, you know, it's surrounded all the way around. So it's nice because you can go any direction, any, anywhere from here. Literally, there's trails all over. And so that makes it one of the busiest trailheads for the Gila Wilderness. And let me just show you around and show you how busy it is. So there's a pretty good set of corrals here. And they have a toilet, you know, hole in the ground with a seat on it. And lots and lots of parking. And you can see that the busiest trailhead around has nobody in it but me. But one thing that's new is there's, they put picnic tables in over there. That's, that's new. Maybe it's for the fire that they just put out. But... Anyways, I need to get these horses unloaded and, you know, packed, so... Ooh, caution. More caution. Great. We're headed out. So here's the first thing. This is the West Fork of the Gila River. And uh, most of the world would call this a stream or a brook or a creek. Nope, we call it a river. And so, like I said, this is the West Fork. There's also a Middle Fork, and uh, you guessed it, an East Fork. just passed there was the Gila cliff dwellings and it's, I think there's like 40 rooms and it was the Mugion Indians or the Membrano Indians I don't even think they know which ones which is funny because they were about 1200 AD and so and Mugion is named after some Spaniard that came over in the 1500s so it doesn't really make sense why they're named that, but they are. Um, they figure 10 to 15 families live there. It's pretty, it's pretty neat. Um, it became a national monument under the Teddy Roosevelt in 1907. And it's one of those places that everybody needs to go to once, but it's kind of over, overdone. There's handrails and stuff everywhere. But uh, yeah, everybody should go there once. And that's about, that's about it for that. Um, archeologists kind of dug everything up before it became a national monument. So there's some old cowboys from the 1800s that carved their name on there, on the wall and stuff. So that's pretty cool, but yeah, it's just, one of those deals we're just it's actually up behind there they set aside 160 acres which is interesting because that's how much you would get for a homestead during the homestead act so we're actually 
built on National Monument right now. It's not even wilderness. When I was on a fifth grade field trip, we went to the cliff dwellings, which is just right back up there up that canyon. And they said that they grew crops down by the river. And this was the only flat opening that I could picture them growing crops. But my fifth grade mind didn't realize that they probably didn't grow crops in rows like conventional farming. So they, pro they probably didn't use this area right here. But I like to think so. Two little coos bucks. Duke. Duke. So just up, you can see those cliffs where the cliff dwellings are. Just up from there is the grudging's cabin. So here you go. It's actually supposed to be two graves here. This might be marking the other one, but they said it. They say it's next to it. I don't know. I'm here at the Grudging's cabin, and there's no cabin left. All there is is a grave of William Grudging's, and so this is kind of a crazy story. So <clears throat> the Grudging's came into this area. To, I believe to originally work for the McKenna Ranch, which was down here. It encompassed, you know, the cliff dwellings, the hot springs, all of that kind of stuff. It's pretty big. And then they started running cattle on their own. And about that same time, the woods started, they came, same thing, but then they started a ranch over on Iron Creek. And so William or Willie and Hank or Henry there are the brothers who lived here and <laughs> the story goes and I've heard a couple different versions I, this is the version I like best uh, the woods boy was camped just a couple miles up here uh, what he was I don't know if he was going to get supplies or if he was coming back from getting supplies and he was taking it back to the ranch and he was murdered and so that kid's name was Charlie Woods and he was with another kid named Francisco Diaz and so both of them were killed Tom Woods and so keep in mind the Grudgings and the Woods were both known cattle thieves and so they didn't have the best reputation in the world um, so Tom Woods came and he murdered William just like the the grave says it says William Grudgings waylaid and murdered by Tom Woods, October 8th, uh, 1833, age 37. And so he was killed up here on the zigzag trail, which I'll show you that here in a second. It's, it's, it's not very far up here. And he, it was witnessed. And then this is where it gets really weird. Cause you know, that just seems like a typical feud. So, <clears throat> They were going over to the town of Mugione. That was kind of the, you know, the main town in this area in the late 1800s for court. And uh, Tom Woods pretty much pled guilty, but he was in custody of a citizen and he was released in a canyon. So he let him go. And then that same citizen, I don't know what his name was, he murdered somebody who was tied in under contracts with Tom Woods. And so between all of that confusion, Tom Woods escaped. And nobody knew what he did for a while, but he eventually showed back up. And what he said he had done was he spent two years hunting down Henry uh, Grudgings. So Hank, and he found him in Louisiana and he said, he was hiding in the reeds and he shot him out of a canoe. So he chased this guy down, this guy's brother, all the way to Louisiana to shoot him out of a canoe. That is crazy. I don't know. <laughs> These people, there's something else. It's not like there's a lot of people around, but yeah, I'll, I'll 
go up here and I'll show you where the zigzag trail is. I think they've renamed it the Big Bear Trail or something, but everybody knows it as the zigzag trail. Here's where the zigzag trail goes up. You can see why it has to be a zigzag, because it has to go up all those cliffs. But that's where James Hoffman uh, witnessed Tom Woods killing William Grudgings. I would take you up there a little ways to show you how zigzaggy it is, but I don't really feel like it. And that's out of the way. But you can imagine. see that there's cliff dwellings all over the place so that's something you're interested in I know where there's some pretty cool ones that aren't really publicized I actually I've heard rumors of one that's a uh, bigger than the Gila cliff dwellings the National Monument and I know where it's at and I went looking for it one day and I couldn't find it because I was coming in from the bottom and everybody says you have to come in from the top. But I don't know, that seems like something you guys would be interested in. Maybe I'll go find that. That'd be pretty neat. I know what canyon it's in, but there's little ones like that one behind us all over the place. Like you'll be walking up a random ridge and you'll find one, it's not surprising. Well, the one time I wasn't recording, we step into a hole in this little tiny creek, right? The one that I was just making fun of for being so small. We step in and my horse had to swim. I tried to pick my feet up, but that didn't work. So now my boots are full of water. Mule can't swim. I don't know if you guys knew that. She was... <laughs> Her head was barely out of the water. We literally drug the mule through the water. That was not good. We can't see the bottom of the river. I saw Duke get in and he backed out and then he was swimming. So I should have uh, looked a little closer. Anyways, right up here, this is Grave Canyon. And it is named after a grave. Imagine that. But uh, it's actually the kid Francisco Diaz that was with the Woods boy. His grave's up here. So it look, seems like they took him a little ways away, but not too far. And uh, Charlie Woods was 15. I don't know how old uh, Francisco was, but I'm guessing he's pretty close. Come on, horse. But yeah, something interesting. All of this rock formation all around is what the West Fork's kind of known for. And according to the sign on the, that I stopped at one time on the side of the road, this was formed about three million years ago. And how they know that, I have not a clue. But it's old. It's pretty neat. See these big pillars and stuff all over. Problem is, the section that I'm in right now, there's no way out. And so, if you get flooded or something, you just kind of have to find some high ground and wait it out. This is the first sign of that fire that I've seen so far. 
It just, they just got it out last week. Well, they just opened it up that last week. But it's been burning since, for over, I don't know, over a month. They said it made it down here, but I wanted to check it out. So if you want to see what a fresh, fresh forest fire looks like, this is it. Doesn't look like it burned too hot right here, so that's good. Here's a typical problem, and it actually hasn't been bad because the fire crew was just in here. And so this is just a new, pretty recent. But it probably doesn't look that steep. This is a pretty big hill both ways. I don't know which way is better. Could go up the bottom. Or I could just go around it right here. We'll go around it right here. That's why I don't ride show horses or roping horses or whatever kind of horses. Duke! Come on, Duke! Faster! Go! I'm a little weary now. That oh, doesn't look too bad. This was kind of what it looked like in that one spot. I can see. Come on. She just jumps everything. Yep, there she goes. been coming to a few of these but I've been getting around them pretty easy this one there's a swamp right there we tried to go through it you see how deep it is horses almost got stuck so time to get this taken care of
I decided to give the horses a break for a minute because we had been fighting through a whole bunch of stuff. But I wanted to show you where I'm at here. So I don't know if you could see the outline, but here is where a man named James Moore lived. And so James moved here in 1880 around, or ish, around 1880, they don't, they don't really know and he didn't tell them, I guess. And you can't ask him. But he <clears throat> moved here in a time that they were fighting Apache still. And I've seen pictures of his cabin when it was still standing in the, from like the 20s or 30s. And there's a V-notch in the door. And they say what that V-notch was for is <laughs> because they were fighting Apaches and he would have to stick his gun out, the, out that V-notch so he could shoot at him and defend himself. Uh, so not not too long after he was he moved here he got attacked by a bear and I don't know if you I'm sure he was hunting hunting that bear but so he got in a, a squabble with the bear ended up killing the bear with a knife but he got messed up real bad his face was all disfigured uh, his arm was messed up and the, the worst part of it was he had a huge gash on his chest and because of this, he was super self-conscious and he kind of stayed secluded and he didn't really, you know, he wasn't very social, you could say. And so a few people did get to know him pretty well. And they said whenever he'd take off his shirt, you could see his heart beating through his chest. So he was messed up real bad. And he never forgave these bears for this. And so what he would do <laughs> was he would trap or somehow he'd, trap them or lure them into a big cage and from what I understand it was big logs that he, he made a cage out of and somebody told me that this was one of his cages and I think that this was his his uh, cabin but I'm not really sure I'm about to go do a little walk around um, so he'd lure them in there and then I've, I've read a couple of accounts of people that are were coming by one one guy said that he had a knife tied onto a stick and he would he was poking pretty much stabbing the bear you know through the cage uh until it died and he did that guy he didn't even stop he just kind of kept riding by and then another one he said uh he would get hot sticks so he'd put the stick in the fire and then he would burn the bear just torturing him he he absolutely hated bears so after his he got attacked and he got messed up everybody just started calling him bear more and so if you know this is this would be considered bear moore's cabin like most people don't even know that his name was james and so um it's pretty interesting he was pretty self-sufficient because he didn't like to you know mingle with people and so down here by the river he had an irrigation system set up and he grew vegetables and he pretty much just hunted and that's how he made his money hunting and trapping well, he did do some prospecting and so uh, one person said or one thing that I, I read said that he wouldn't tell anybody where this gold was that he found except for one guy and that's because he needed help getting lower down with a rope because there was no other way to get to it and so that guy you know he helped him through the summer and then whenever it got winter he left and I'm not really sure what year this was uh, but in uh, 1924 they found his body up in Little Turkey Park and he had two broken legs and he had lit a tree a down tree on fire and he had crawled along as it burned until it ran out of tree and then he died from exposure and broken legs I'm sure that didn't help so I don't know if he got attacked by a bear that he's trying to capture or if he fell off something trying to get some gold but anyways some um, government trappers uh they found his body and they buried him and where they buried him they put a there's a big rock with a it just says i think it says bear more and then february 24. and so just to give you a little bit of perspective uh there's another account of somebody that saw him in the year 1900 and he looked to be 50 or 60 years old and so if you you know do the math this guy was either 
seven between let's say 75 and 85 years old and he was still out here finding gold torturing bears and just living in the wild right here and you know it wasn't really it was a long time ago but it wasn't that long ago so you know you would watch movies like the revenant actually i've never seen the revenant but i hear it's pretty good crazy stories like that we got people just as crazy here they should make a movie if somebody wants to write a movie or make a movie about bear more you should you know cut me in because it'd be a good one i'll at least watch it you don't even have to give me any money just make sure you do it right anyways so i'm gonna do some looking around here if i find anything interesting i'll let you know but if not i'm just gonna head up the trail okay so i was doing some wandering around and you can still kind of see his irrigation system but then look i don't know how i've missed this I... is this his cabin I don't... or is this a bear cage it doesn't look very big and maybe he had logs on top of it so is this his cage or is that his cage if you have any idea or any insight put in the comments so that way i can you know educate myself i don't know this is definitely it doesn't look very big for a cabin i don't know or maybe that was just where he stored his vegetables and stuff i don't know you can definitely see signs of old irrigation systems and stuff so i don't know pretty interesting but storm's coming so i better get going before i get stuck in the rain again and i'm to what they call <laughs> well, i'm in the box probably not a good place to be when it's raining but i'm more worried about it raining higher than me not well here i hear those are big rocks this right here is a page i haven't been recording but i've crossed this river about 50 times in the last half mile and the trail is just rocky and rough. We have to go around logs and but hopefully we're through it here in a few minutes. Just got to thinking. Did I lock the truck? I don't think I'm gonna go back. It'll be fine. Take them off one by one. Take them up the trail. I am. Well, we made it through that rough stuff. And this is one of the only decent campsites for a while so I think we're gonna camp here tonight well I have camp set up how do you how do you tell if your mules tired they just lay there yeah I think she's tired my tarp which is way bigger than I expected that dog's tired If you ever wondered what Hell's Hole looks like, 
This is it. Don't go in there, Duke. I don't know what you'll come back as. There's some cliff dwellings around. There's some up here on the other side. I've heard that there's an altar, but you have to have field glasses to see them. And so if you're younger than 75, field glasses are binoculars. And funny story, I never leave home without binoculars, but this time I forgot them. I think that right up there is the altar. Not a hundred percent sure. I don't know what they were doing, what they were sacrificing, but it's kind of spooky. So I could have swore that I saw some cliff dwellings from across the river there, and I think they're right up here, but I can't can't tell. I was going to show you, but this is it. It looks like any other bend in the river, except there's a big hole in the wall. Oh, look, berries. I wonder if I should eat them. So I'm back on the trail. I didn't wasn't in any hurry this morning. So it's kind of a late start. We just headed up the river. Oh, here's a sign right here. White Creek, three and three quarter miles. Cliff Dwellings, 12 miles. So I'm only about 12 miles and it's not too bad. Um, I got to thinking, is this a vlog? If it is, I guess I really am a millennial. So that's kind of depressing a little bit, but. So we're headed up right now to ride around a big box that's down here in the bottom. And you'd think that, you know, when I was younger, I used to hate all of these ride arounds. You had to climb way up the mountain just to go around and drop back down. But as you get older, you realize that these trails up here high are way easier to maintain. And so even though it seems like a lot of work to get around them, in the long run, it's way better. You can get through the bottom down here on foot. There is a trail, but it, it's really hard to maintain. And so they have this ride around for horses. Come on. It's still pretty rocky though. Ooh. And I'm going to get wet. I haven't been filming because it's just been raining. Just sitting here. It's slowed down a lot now. It was raining pretty good there for a minute. But I made it off of that trail that goes up around Okay, so it kind of slowed down raining a little bit. It's still drizzling. But I wanted to show you this place right here. So they call these the falls. And they're, it's pretty cool. There's some big pools and stuff in here. Kind of one of those destination places people like to come swimming or whatever. But the interesting thing is uh, in the early 2000s, like 2000, I don't know, three or four or something, Game and Fish really started pushing, bringing back the Gila trout, which is a native species that was pretty much wiped out because of all the uh, 
exotic species that they were bringing in, like the rainbows and the browns and you know that kind of stuff. I think mainly rainbows in the in this drainage. But they so they used the falls here as a natural barrier to keep all of the invasive species down and keep all the native species up. So they poisoned or they killed all the fish above it and then they restocked it with Gila trout. And for a long time, well, for a long time you couldn't fish above the falls, but you could fish below it. But I just read in the proclamation a few days ago that you can't fish anywhere within the West Fork or any of the drainages because they're trying to bring back those Gila trout. But it's just kind of interesting. Um, I know for a fact, because I've caught fit Gila trout down below, that this barrier didn't keep them from going down. It might have kept those other fish from coming up, but I've definitely caught Gila trout down lower. You know, it's been a while though. But it's pretty, pretty neat. And most of the year, this water's crystal clear. It's just muddy right now from the rain, but it, it's really a just a beautiful spot. Duke, what is this? What is that, Duke? Anybody know what that is? It's got the third one I've seen recently. So I didn't mention where this river goes. So, you know, all three of these branches get together and then they turn into what we call the main Gila. And then it runs through, it goes down through southern Arizona uh, across. It pretty much supplies a lot of the water for the Phoenix area. And then I'm pretty sure it's dried up by then. But then it'll eventually run into the Colorado River and then, you know, tie in with that. But, so, if you live in the Phoenix area, every time my horse pees in the water, you're welcome. that this here is the white creek cabin and it has a lot of history just like everywhere else so right up here this is white creek and so this is why it's the white creek cabin um there's a grave Oh, look, a clip to a radio. Huh. So, <clears throat> there's a grave up here from the original original people that, that homesteaded it. It's supposed to be at the base of this hill. I've never even looked for it or found it. But, um, <laughs> so another grave, another dead person story. So, the story goes, this guy, his name is Jason Baxter. And he was killed by Apaches and they buried him here. But during that time, late 1800s, you could ride in and kind of get a claim for your money or for the money that you lost. And so there, I actually saw a document that um, had everything broke down that the Apaches had stolen when they killed this guy. And funny thing is, uh, Tom Woods, you know, the guy from down the river that that killed the Grudgings brothers. Uh, he was on here as one of the witnesses, so he saw them, and they they said that it was part of Geronimo's gang. So they were the kind of the first ones, and then the Jinx, Jinx homesteaded it, and they had a cabin here, and they were running cattle, and, and the story goes with them, is they got caught stealing cattle, cattle rustling, 
and or was it, it might have been sheep sheep or cattle I don't I don't know but they they were taking him to one of the jinx brothers to jail and he killed the guy over in Johnson Canyon which I'll show you that here in a little bit so he kills the guy gets back and then they catch him again and they're taking him to Silver City for trial and somehow he gets killed so I don't know if he was trying to escape again and got killed so that's kind of the story behind the Jinx Ranch and then this building that we have here it was actually built by Game and Fish I think it was in 1924 and so it was built as uh, they, it was a fish hatchery. That stuff that I just showed you by the corral that we walked by, well, there was a like a barn and stuff, but they actually had a fish hatchery here. And so this main th this main building here was built by Game and Fish. And then Game and Fish gave up on it. Oh. I've only been in this building once. because it's always locked up. But anyways, Game and Fish gave it to the Forest Service because, I don't know, they didn't need it anymore, I guess. And um, then with the Forest Service, they built, uh, they, they used this as one of their ranger stations. And so the ranger stations used to be a lot smaller. So this was the White Creek Ranger Station. And they built a big barn and they, they did that, they started in the late 30s and they're using CCCs, um, which stands for, I don't know, Civilian Conservation Corps, Civil Conservation, I don't know, I'm gonna look that up, I guess. But anyways, so during the Great Depression, um, the government would pay these guys because they were unemployed to work and they did a ton of work. A bunch of these walls even on these trails that we've been using you see walls most of those were built by CCC's a lot of the trails a lot of the roads around here but anyway so they built this huge barn and it was kind of like the thing that stood out about this this place and then about 15 20 years ago some Boy Scouts were camped there and they knocked the lantern over and they burned the barn down and so now there's now there's no barn. So it's kind of gone downhill. Forest Service still uses it, but it's, I don't know. It's not as maintained as it used to be. Another thing that was interesting about this, it had running water in it and an indoor sink, and so it was pretty pretty fancy for its time. Um, a lot of people, a lot of locals here around this area. If you ask them what their favorite part of the Gila Wilderness is, it's the White Creek Cabin. But uh, I was talking to one guy about a year ago, and this was his favorite place. He hasn't been here in years, even though he's been all around, because he wants to keep that memory of what it looked like and not what it's turned into now just because it's gone downhill. But it's still a pretty neat area. You can see where the fish hatchery and stuff was. And there's still corrals, they still use it. I'm sure, like that clip to the radio, they're probably using it during these fires just recently. And so, you know, somebody's been picking up deadheads, some sheds. So, yeah, so this is the White Creek Cabin. So, I'm headed out from leaving the West Fork. There's the corrals and the cabin there behind us. You can kind of see old structures. But I should mention that there's a fault that runs through White Creek. And in the, I think it's 20s, 30s, 40s, somewhere in there, there used to be a lot of tremors and earthquakes. And so, yeah, I haven't felt any, but I'm sure at some point they'll come back again. That's just this area. You can see, man, they had to carve a lot of this out by hand to make this. It's another CCC project. Just digging. Those guys, all they wanted to do was work. They didn't have stimulus checks and the government just paying them for sitting around. They actually had to do something. Maybe we should bring that back.
So I'm up here, I just made it to the top. Um, I'm actually gonna go this way because it'll cut off some time. But just a couple things. So Johnson Canyon is just right over here. And then off of Johnson um, is raw meat. And so the interesting, I always thought that was a weird name for a canyon until I heard that the reason why it's named that there's two cowboys where they shot a deer and they were going to eat it but they couldn't get a fire started I get, I'm assuming because of the rain or something and so they had to eat it raw and so they just started calling the canyon raw meat after that and it stuck but yeah it's just it's just right over there not the, just right over the hill so this fire that we've been riding through pretty much the whole time it's all the same fire it's the johnson fire and so obviously it started over in johnson creek there behind us and it started on may 20th of 2021 and it burned just shy of 90,000 acres and they just opened this part of the wilderness back up from it uh, just a few days ago. And so, and it's the middle of July now. So this fire burned for, I don't know, over a month, well over a month. And you can see it's already starting to green up. So it just shows how fast the grass recovers from these fires. You know this this area does burn almost every year but but yeah this is all fresh real fresh fire from the start of the actually a pretty big area so this is just you know I'm just in part of it right now <clears throat> but so McKenna Park is actually named wrong so the McKinney's homesteaded it and they had a ranch they actually were tied in with the White Creek cabin and that stuff during the Apache raids and that kind of thing but so they had all of this but the guy that we've been talking about before the McKenna he's the one he wrote a book called Black Range Tales uh, he had a big ranch he was just well known in this area so people started mistakenly calling this place McKenna Park instead of McKinney because their names are so close together and so and it just kind of stuck so if you look on any map or anything it's, it's gonna say McKenna Park when really it should be saying McKinney Park so here's a sign that says McKenna Park there's a pond right over there a tank um, this is a really popular place as if you just look at it it looks like elk country and it's pretty awesome um, and I'm not saying that there's not elk in here but if you show up here during elk season there's gonna be a lot of people with uh, black and white license plates with a little star on them and so you know there are elk here but it's super popular and the reason why or one is well not just because of the area because it looks like elk country um, <laughs> this is about as far as you can get into the wilderness without getting closer to the other side so it doesn't matter which direction you come this is about as far as you can go and so people are always trying to get away from everyone so they want to go deeper and deeper and this is pretty much the middle right here and so it attracts a lot of people so this trail 
who knows how long it's been, well other than the firefighters who knows how long it's been since somebody's been on here but if you come here during elk season you'll you'll see it quite a bit. in a park here is there is rumors of a guy who had some kind of treasure in a box and he stashed it away under a, like a root ball of a fallen tree and he went back to find it and he couldn't find it and so the rumor is that that treasure and I don't know if it's gold that he was prospecting or if it was just money he had or I don't know what the treasure is but that guy spent the rest of his life looking for it and people have been looking for it ever since and to be honest with you I kind of keep an eye out every time I'm in this area because you never know that'd be pretty neat to find some real life treasure so, if you're ever in McKenna Park, keep an eye out. Obviously, it won't be on a root ball of a tree now because this was, you know, 100 years ago or maybe even more. But you never know, you might get lucky. elephant in the room and why trails in the Gila are so bad so this trail is actually pretty good right now um, going up the West Fork that's probably the best I've ever seen it um, and that's because the firefighters were just in there so historically the Forest Service has had trail crews and they have to write proposals for money and they have to work pretty hard to get that money because almost all the Forest Service budget goes into fire and so there's a couple guys that they worked really hard in the office writing things and they both retired and so the last couple years um, they haven't had trail crews at all and so what they do is they use the firefighters and they tell those firefighters that when they're not fighting fires they need to be maintaining trails or working on trails but you can't blame those guys they work super hard but they're not going to want to go out and clear trails whenever they just got off of a big fire or something and so Right now, there's nobody maintaining the trails other than people like me riding through, just at least making it where you can get by. Or firefighters, when they're fighting fires, they come through and they can use chainsaws because, you know, they're not restricted whenever they're fighting a fire. So they can come through here with a chainsaw and clear it out way faster than just, you know, using um, crosscut saws or axes and th or those kind of things and so uh, another thing is a little secret so don't tell anybody but the Gila wilderness is the least visited wilderness area in the US and so it just doesn't have get a lot of travel or a lot of traffic and so these trails they just kind of sit and so these ones up high up on top there they they hold together pretty well but the ones that, that like down on the river, they get overgrown really bad and get washed out and stuff. And so it's just a lack of traffic, which I'm not complaining about that because I'd rather be a little secret, I guess. The, other, the only other people who maintain it are outfitters. So they used to have a lot of you know, ranches or cowboys that would come in here 
and they would maintain trails and fences and water and they'd pack in salt for their animals and then in the really stopped in the 90s they started cutting allotments and so all of those cowboys they stopped maintaining water and stopped maintaining trails and so everything has just kind of gone downhill there's a lot of conspiracy theory behind it like maybe they're trying to you know the do-gooders are trying to make this area more primitive or go completely back to its natural state uh, they won't officially say that but I don't know it might be somewhat true but yeah so that's pretty much why the trails are so bad just lack of funding from Forest Service or lack of desire to get that funding and uh, just not very many people so it's pretty much outfitters and vol I should say volunteers because uh, people like the back uh, backcountry horsemen they do they do a lot of volunteer work in the in the with trails and they do a really good job but to be honest with you they're kind of older and their or their members are kind of older and they just volunteer and so they don't get they'll come out for a week and they just don't get very far um, I'm not I'm definitely not complaining I think they do great work you just can't get all of it done because there's so many miles of trail that you but pretend like those trees weren't there you know the kind of the newer growth ones and this used to be a runway so you know the the Gila wilderness became a wilderness in 1924 and it was with Aldo Leopold he kind of headed that up and so everybody kind of knows that story but then the wilderness act didn't go into effect until 1964 so even though so between 1924 and 1964 they were still doing a lot of improvements in the wilderness and this was one of them so they were building a runway like I had said earlier this is kind of in the middle and so this would be a good place you know you could picture it as a runway it actually went this way more but uh, and so they they had equipment in here and there's still signs of the road that they had made to get in here with their dozers and you can still find metal pieces I found a old battery one time there's a culvert up here and so you could definitely tell that they you know they were doing a lot of work another crazy thing is whenever that wilderness act went into effect there's rumors that there were six dozers in the wilderness still and so these were d2s so they're really they're the small little dozers two-ton dozers and instead of uh driving them out they thought it or they found it to be cheaper to leave them and so what they did was they dug a hole with them and then they threw a canvas tarp over the top and then they filled it in by hand and i talked to somebody and he claims that he knows where two of them are and there's there's supposed to be i've heard two here in mckenna park and i've also heard that there's four of them here in mckenna park so either way somewhere around here and i'm guessing it would be you know somewhere close to this airstrip that there are dozers buried and they were working functional up until they buried them I'm sure they're no good now probably seized up but it's just something kind of interesting that there was still development in here after you see that it's like big roll of wire that might be telegraph wire so there's also telegraphs running all through the wilderness and I bet that's what that is is telegraph wire but you know you could see where it's eroded but you could definitely picture this being a runway I also heard somebody was telling me that uh, they they were down at White Creek Cabin 
and a guy showed up with his daughter and they, they just had little day packs on and they went down there to go fishing and he asked where where they were camped and he said they they said they told him that he they flew in and they landed here so apparently there was people landing landing on this runway before it was officially open and you could definitely you know if all this was cleared out and before all this was eroded and this would have been in the 70s or 80s so not not that long ago you could still get a little Cessna or something if you have tundra tires I, I'm sure I'm sure those crazy bush pilots from Alaska could they could probably still land here here's a little bit better view and I'm almost positive you could get a super cub or something in here even today just right now I bet you could land right there right on the trail this trail here it goes from McKenna Park, drops down into Ring Canyon, and it's kind of like a, kind of a shortcut. But the funny thing is, this trail, from my understanding, was built by Dot Campbell's. And look her up. So it's built by Dot Campbell, and it wasn't an official, you know, systems trail for a long, long time. And then eventually the main trail, which is up over this way, it, I don't know if it got washed out or if it just got so bad that they didn't want to use it anymore. And so the Forest Service adopted this trail as one of the main ones into McKenna Park, even though, you know, originally it wasn't, wasn't one of the main trails. So Doc Campbell's was, you know, Kind of a businessman r rancher slash outfitter in this area for a long time he uh i think he died in 96 so not that long ago but he definitely had a huge influence on this area in the more you know more recent recent times <laughs> No idea where the trail is, but it's somewhere down the creek. Doesn't really matter which way you go as long as you get there. started to rain were sprinkle so I pulled over the first place I could got the tarp set up just kind of threw everything under here it's not a real great spot you can see where everything's been washing so I couldn't find a place that hadn't washed away so hopefully I stay dry if it rains hard but, all right Duke, are you thirsty? Are you thirsty? <laughs> Morning of day three. Um, 
got eight, a little before eight, so I didn't get a super early start. But I'm headed down the trail. It rained pretty much all night, but my tarp held out, so stayed dry. I'm crossing Nat Straw Canyon right now, and a little backstory on Nat, Nat Straw. He was your typical predator trapper type guy. Uh, he came into this country in the in around 1870, and he spent most of his time uh, just trapping bears and lions and shooting coyotes and stuff like that. He would work for local ranchers and they would pay him a bounty or he would contract work with them. So he killed a bunch of stuff, wolves, grizzly bears. He seemed to be a pretty friendly guy and he loved conversation. And a few other things that made him different he loved to read, so he would read anything that he could get a hold of, and he kept a clean camp. He's always clean. Most of these mountain men, they uh, <clears throat> they were pretty dirty, and most of them didn't really want to talk to anybody, but he was super friendly, and he would visit with people as much as he could. He, is, he had a crazy backstory. He lived on the Navajo reservation for a while and married a Navajo lady. He had two kids with her, but then he kind of lost contact with them. They think he was, he was trying to get close to them for, to find some gold. And then he moved down here into the Gila, spent pretty much the rest of his life down here. He, uh, the end of his, the end of his uh, story is kind of sad. He, he didn't want to, he was afraid that coyotes were going to scatter his bones. And so when he got to be old, he decided to move out of the wilderness and go live in town. And then his money ran out and he pretty much became an alcoholic and he had cancer from smoking a pipe. And he was just an interesting, interesting character. And he died in 1941. And so... There's people that I knew that knew him. And he's kind of one of those, he was a legend in his own time, and he's, but he's not as famous as like Ben Lilly or anything like that. So Ben Lilly, when he died, only six people went to his funeral. And they lived a similar lifestyle, even though they knew of each other, they didn't know each other, which is kind of weird because they're kind of doing the same thing in the same area, except, Ben Lilly had hounds and uh, so he was afraid that nobody was going to come to his funeral so that's why he moved out of the wilderness and he was 85 by the time he died but he was pretty interesting interesting guy he loved to tell stories he had stories about <laughs> saddle breaking a bear and all kinds of crazy stuff a lot of crazy stories about grizzly bears and stuff so yeah nat straw this is nat straw canyon washed out just like everything else did this year can stay up on this ridge, trail runs all the way down, pretty much to the truck. Nine and three quarters miles is what that says. Those are never right. 
and then or I could drop down here in the little creek a little bit further ride but it's not as rocky this way is pretty rocky and there's some pretty bad spots this one's usually pretty good but I think it might be flooded I think I'm gonna go the longer way so I don't have to deal with the rocks and stuff this little draw right here can get washed out sometimes. So we'll see what happens. This trail is in pretty good shape. Actually. I always act like they haven't had a drink. This is Little Creek. And. Before there were system trails, they kind of used this as a easy way to get across the wilderness. And so there were no trails up on top other than game trails and maybe just paths that they made. And so they would use Little Creek kind of to shuttle across the wilderness before it was a wilderness. And so it's usually pretty easy to get through. And they're, they're used to always be water in it there's not very much water in it now other than down low and it comes out at the hot springs but it kind of gets boxed up towards the end so you can't just ride all the way through without some real struggles but yeah little creek when I said you could see some old roads and stuff here's one it's starting to wash out but you used to be able to really tell that this was cut out with it not sure if it's the official name but they call this thousand mile ridge and the only thing I can figure is they named it that because it feels like you're riding a thousand miles on it. And it used to not be too bad because there was actually some shade. But this fire came through. This was the Miller fire. They came through in, I don't know, 2011? In my mind, it's just a couple years ago. But I'm getting old, and so that's kind of how I think. Just a couple years ago but yeah so it burned up all the shade and so now you're just out here baking in the sun riding and the problem is you can see where you're going probably can't see it on the camera but you can see the cliffs and stuff right there by the trailhead so you think you're getting close but really you got a ways to go See the visitor center and housing and stuff down there so you think we're close we still have a good hour ride mile ridge do yourself a favor and take this little shortcut uh, it'll cut off 20 to 30 minutes of riding and the four circus doesn't want you to take it because they think it's too dangerous or treacherous or something because of the slick rock but they also thought that you know those trails that I was just on were too I'm 
dropping off here to the truck, I just wanted to say that this whole trip, I don't know how many miles I went, but I'll, I'll put it on there. Um, I saw a set of horse tracks going up the West Fork. That they're actually coming down, and I'm sure that they're those, from those firefighters. And then on this trail, I've seen another set or a couple horses, and then one guy walking. It looked like they're the same, and uh, but you don't see anybody else. So, pretty much to the end. Thanks for watching. Thanks for making it to the end. I'm sure I missed some stuff, or I didn't get some details 100% correct but if I miss something that you know of put in the comments this was just one little chunk of the Gila wilderness and so you could go any direction and you know have a similar experience so yeah. I'm back at the truck just got everything unsaddled, but I wanted to show you. I might show a clip, I might not. But these people at the trailhead here, they had these young horses. And they they had those uh you know those saddle saddle panniers, the bright orange ones. I think they just took them out of the wrapper. They look brand new. And they're gonna head up head up here a little ways just to go test out packing and it was just kind of odd to was talking to them the funny thing is guess what color their license plate is yep black and white i called that one